If you're just starting out in astrophotography and don't know where to begin, here's a crash course in the basic hardware and apps that you'll need to start out. It all begins with the tripod, the foundation that holds the telescope. There are variations on tripods, including pillars that are fixed right into the ground, tripods that look more like long poles, four pods, and other variations. But I find the Skywatcher EQ6R tripod to be heavy and solid, so at this time, it is my preferred tripod for astrophotography. On top of the tripod sits the mount. The mount is a mechanism which slowly turns the telescope to compensate for Earth's rotation. And good mounts will also compensate for how objects appear to rotate in the sky, as the turning of the Earth leads to a changing perspective. On top of the mount sits the telescope. There are many types of telescopes and the topic is far too deep to go into in this brief introduction. Popular telescope types include refractors and reflectors, of which there are many variations. Refractors use glass or crystalline lenses to collect and focus light, and reflectors tend to use a combination of mirrors and lenses. To the telescope, we will have attached the primary imaging camera. We might use just an ordinary DSLR and everyday digital camera, or we might use dedicated astro cameras. There are two basic types, monochrome and color cameras, and some are cooled by various mechanisms and some are not. Astro cameras are an extremely deep topic, perhaps the deepest topic in all of astrophotography, and one we'll take a closer look at in future episodes. In addition to the telescope, we need some way to help the mount find its way as it tracks objects across the sky. Often, we use a guide scope. That is a small telescope mounted on top the larger telescope. The guide scope will have its own camera, often a camera with larger pixels and usually monochrome as they are better at catching light. This camera operates independently from the other camera and is used exclusively to guide the telescope, though it is possible to capture images with the guide scope. And I have done so occasionally, especially when I am interested in imaging a wide field. There are many alternative variations to all of this. For example, instead of using a guide scope, one could use an off-axis guider with a guiding camera. And to improve the quality of images, one could use any number of light filters. High and low pass filters are used to filter out unwanted ultraviolet and infrared light that can lead to blurriness, diffraction, and other problems in astro images. And narrow band pass filters filter out all but specific frequencies of light. When I shot the image of the East Vale Nebula that you are about to see, I used a dual narrow band pass filter to filter out the scatter of light that was created by the full moon. There are also tri-band filters and quad-band filters. These filters are designed to admit only the light that is emitted by objects in space and to filter out light created by such sources as light pollution and the light of the full moon. And as you will shortly see, they can be very effective. Focusing on interstellar objects can be tricky business. Stars need to be made as pinpoints as possible, and it can be hard for the human eye to determine perfect sharpness especially when we're looking at those stars on a monitor after they have been relayed through a camera. And even if you manage to obtain perfect sharpness, atmospheric changes such as changes in temperature can create slight to significant changes in focus. Attached to this telescope is an electronic focuser. It allows the user to manually focus to within a good degree of accuracy, then hand over fine focus to the computer's automated focusing system. To get all of these components to work together smoothly, requires a number of applications working in synchrony. For the average user, this is typically likely to include a number of ASCOM drivers that are being manipulated through various applications, such as SharpCap, EQMod, or, very popularly lately, Nina, which is an incredible application that unites all the previous functions into a single program, which might better be thought of as a hub through which one can access the various programs. And I won't lie to you, the learning curve to use any of these applications is also significant. But, as they say, nothing worthwhile is easy. And I think anyone could learn to do astrophotography if they had the motivation to devote some time to it. It is a craft, an art, and a science all rolled up into one. You can learn the basics in a matter of weeks and use a simple mount, such as a non-go-to tracker, like the Skywatcher Star Adventurer, which is designed to hold an ordinary DSLR and can actually provide some incredibly good results with a little practice. And if you are so inclined, you can become very advanced and invest, honestly, a great deal of money in very good go-to trackers that can move telescopes in their assemblies very precisely against the rotation of the Earth. 
and provide incredible views of the objects to be found both in our solar system and in deep space. There's always a learning curve, but as with most things, it can go from basic to extremely advanced, and you yourself can choose just how far you want to take astrophotography. So that's the bare bones basics of what you're going to need with hardware and applications. We will take a closer look at each of those later on, but if we were to go into any of those even a little bit here, this video would end up hours long. Now, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to my workflow when shooting astrophotography. Once the equipment is all set up outdoors, I take a moment to align the mount on True North. I used to do this the old-fashioned way by using an alignment scope built within the mount. But these days, I just use Nina, which has an accurate and fast and very simple way of aligning the mount perfectly or nearly perfectly just by using the camera to take images of whatever stars it is looking at. While this is faster than doing it the old way, it too has a bit of a learning curve and is something we'll look at in a future video. You're probably starting to think, man, we're going to be looking at a lot of stuff in future videos, aren't we? And the truth is, yes. Now, it's important to take a few minutes to do a very good, precise alignment. Fortunately, with modern plate solving, alignments have become much easier and they are much more precise than they used to be. And they don't require any additional expensive equipment. But the alignment must be precise, even if it takes us some time to get there. A precise alignment is what allows the mount to move the telescope in perfect rotation with the Earth, so that there is no movement-induced streaking of the various objects we will image. But once the mount is aligned, now we can get down to business. Using a technique called plate solving, I have the telescope take a test image of the sky, and using the locations of the stars, the computer determines in which direction the telescope is pointing. I can then select an object in Nina, and tell the computer to tell the mount to slew and line up on that object. The computerized mount, knowing where it is pointing, can slew in the direction that it thinks the object is. Once it gets in the general vicinity of that object, and it's usually quite accurate in its initial estimation, it'll take another picture and plate solve again. The software might need to repeat this process once or twice more, but it will, in fairly short order, have the telescope pointed exactly at the space object that we want to view. And, I'm sure you guessed it at this point, we'll take a look at plate solving later. Any one of these topics will take a great deal of study, and this video is just an introduction. Once we are pointed at our object, we need to get guiding going. A mount on its own will do its best to turn with the rotation of the Earth, pointing the telescope at an object with a great degree of accuracy. But to shoot deep sky objects, which are very dim, you might have to keep your camera activated or the shutter open. Even though astro cameras don't actually use shutters, it's an electronic shutter for 3, 5, 10, 20, 30, 60 minutes or more. Whereas unguided, a mount is typically good for 2-3 to three minutes exposures. Though some of the better modern mounts I have heard can go as much as 10 minutes unguided, but you pay a pretty penny for those. It's frankly better and easier just to use guiding. And these days, the typical and preferred application for guiding is PHD2 which is one of the software applications that's not actually all that hard to use. In fact, PHD stands for Push Here Dummy. No joke, Push Here Dummy. This is what the PHD application looks like. And like a dummy, I didn't think to screen capture the last time I used it when I was shooting the Veil Nebula a few days ago. So we're just going with a blank screen here, but I'll insert a record of that shot right here. This diagram represents PHD2 aligning and calibrating the mounts with the software. And this here represents the tracking with the corrections. The continuous waves represent how much the mount might be drifting off either in right ascension or declination. And the large vertical pulses represent when the software PHD2 is making a correction pulse to set the mount back perfectly on track. Overall, the mount is tracking pretty good. Not quite as good as I'd want, but pretty darn good. Enough to shoot nice seven minutes exposures without a hitch. The end result was that the mount kept the telescope pointed very accurately at the East Veil parts of the Veil Nebula throughout the night, and I was able, with no problem, to shoot 7 minutes exposures. I imaged the Eastern Veil for 140 minutes, or 27 minute exposures. Of those 20 exposures, two had to be discarded due to satellites tracking across the image, but the rest came out remarkably well. These were all stacked in serial. I posted two videos about stacking in Cyril a while back, one video covering stacking automatically with scripts, and the other video covering how to do it manually, 
I prefer the manual method as it gives better control and overall I feel it gives better results. Stacking effectively adds up all the light or information that the camera has captured in each individual frame, otherwise known as a sub or subframe. These subframes then need to be developed because deep sky objects such as nebulae are, are well, they're dim. So once the images are captured, we have to amplify the light even further to bring them into view. The night sky is actually full of huge nebulae, and if our human eyes were more sensitive to the dark, we would be amazed at what we see. The night sky as we see it now is, is a pale and paltry comparison to what we could actually see if we had better night vision. It's a, perhaps a trivial note here, but I've often wondered what the night sky must look like to an owl which has eyes a hundred times more light sensitive than a human's. Well, that is something I might cover in another video on another channel. But for now, here's the product of all our hard work, setting up the telescope and mounts, aligning it, taking the time to learn all those applications, getting them all working smoothly together, and then spending hours and hours collecting light information. This, my friends, is the Eastern Veil Nebula in all its glory. To me, the ability to open our eyes to the larger universe around us far more than outweighs the cost of the effort.